All right, welcome to another episode of 7 Million Bikes, a Vietnam podcast. I'm your host, as always, Neil Mackay. Now, my guest today is the founder and creator of the Vietnamese Boat People podcast. It's an award-winning podcast which shares the stories of Vietnamese diaspora, something we've talked a lot about with our guests who are children of people who were, in fact, Vietnamese boat people. She's the youngest of seven children and was born in Nha Trang here in Vietnam before her family risked their lives to flee Vietnam. My guest today, I'm very excited to have on, is Tracy Nguyen Mang. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. You are very go and listen to that so before we get through to the final questions we'll just tell everyone about this conversation starter kit because i think when i read that i was like wow as you can tell by the way i've been talking i've interviewed lots of different guests who we've touched on this subject lots of time and when i saw that on your website i was like wow i bet that's so helpful to so many people Yes, no, I appreciate uh, you asking. And actually, if I could share that in context with sort of other things that we do. Um, so the podcast started first and um, I was seeing like organically uh, communities coming and people reaching out. And I was like, wow, like I was right. There is like people like me who really want a space for all of this. Um, so then we started doing like events in person and, you know, with COVID more online, which actually worked in our favor because we could reach to so many more people. Um, and then we did a blog because some people don't want to be interviewed, but they want to share their story in like a personal journal or writing. So those things came first. And through those things, what I was learning was that when we did a community event or when someone submitted a blog, you know, I'd have very informal conversations with them. And what I was learning was that like more often than not, a lot of them were saying, you know, I was, I found your podcast and I really gravitated towards it because my parents didn't talk about this growing up. And so I had very limited knowledge. And I feel like when I listen to your podcast, I feel like maybe I can empathize a little bit more with my what my mom and dad had to go through. Maybe why they're so hesitant to talk about this, because it is painful for some that really are still trying to heal within. Um, and so then I would I would say something like, well, you should just ask them, like, well, what do you have to lose? You know, just ask them. I was like, I felt very intimidated to ask my dad growing up because we didn't have that one, that type of relationship. But when I finally got it in my head that like the worst he could do is just say he doesn't want to talk about it or, you know, say a couple of sentences. I was like, literally, that's the worst that could happen. But then I would get feedback that was like, yeah, but like, I don't even know where to start. You know, there's, there's um, oral history kits out there, but they feel so like clinical and that's when I just was like, you know what? I want people to have this dialogue at home. Like, I, I love the fact that they're listening to our podcast and they feel some sort of connection to their own family history, even if it's not their family story. Um, but what if we could then encourage them to now go home or sit down with a family member and ask these questions? And if it feels intimidating, what if we could create something that just makes it feel less intimidating? And that's how we came up with the concept of the conversation kit. And it's in digital form right now. I am in the process of trying to get it printed kits so that we can distribute them in the in certain communities or make them available for purchase. It's super um, cheap. Super cheap to get stuff printed here in Vietnam. Just I'll get it printed here yes. for you and send it over. <laughs> yes. I mean, we, you know, we did it to be like it's free it's digital so if you have the time look at it online or print it out but the way that we set it up is that there is some historical context it's a very short timeline of major events that might have led to you know their families wanting to flee um and then there's like a template where like as they're talking they can like jot down stuff uh, we have instructions on how to record it themselves um, but i think the real basis of it is we designed it to be a game. And so um, there's four categories. Um, they're broken up into like um, memories, reflections, uh, you know, just categories of which underneath are 12 questions. 
And um, if you were to print it out or in the card game, it would be where you would take turns either um, two people or a family and just pick a card and ask a question. So what I think it does is that it minimizes the need of like, oh my God, what question do I ask first? Like, how do I even start this? So that it's just something simple that you can pick up and be like, hey, the card says mom and dad, like, where were you born in Vietnam? And tell me about your earliest memory of that place or your favorite memory of that place, right? Or tell us about your favorite dish in Vietnam and why you loved it so much. Because the thing about stories is that you learn so much by starting somewhere simple, right? Because they can say, you know what? I love bun mayo growing up. And bun mayo is actually my favorite dish. (laughs) But they can say, I love it because it reminds me of like every Sunday morning. That's what mom would do. Mm. My mom, your grandmother would, you know, do these steam batches of bun mayo and serve them in these small, tiny ceramic dishes. Mm. But all of that comes out of just one question that says, what was your favorite dish and why? And what do you remember most about? Because they're not just going to give a one word answer. Like, oh yeah, it's bun mi. They're going to expand. I mean, I know that from this podcast. I just have to say one question and then someone will talk for half an hour and I just sit here like fascinated. Today's a good case. So, (laughs) Yeah, so the conversation kit was basically saying, you know what, we're going to try to help you learn more, but we're going to try to do it in a way so that it doesn't feel intimidating. And I how um I get how some, you know, Vietnamese or family relationships can be. They're all varying degrees. You know, some families are super close, super open, super communicative. Others are more reserved. I mean, it really varies. And so like the kit was just designed to be like, you know, just because you're not a family that naturally shares doesn't mean you can't start. Um and so, yeah, it's been something that we, we've we started and we've tried. Um, um, and I think printing it will make it better because I think one of the hard things with having it digital is that during um, COVID, families are far apart. And if you wanted to even do it on the phone or over Zoom with your parents, they have to navigate the digital <laughs> version. So, um, so we, we do want to get to a physical kit and try to distribute it um, in certain communities. And have you had uh, much feedback on it that's made you just be like, wow? Yeah, so we've gotten a couple of emails um, from people uh, that have said, you know, wow, thank you so much for creating this. Um, I just want to tell you, I used it with my dad and I just cried nonstop talking to him. Uh, she said to me, I know that wasn't your intention, but like I had no idea what my dad had to, you know, live through. And this was the first time that I actually learned um about his upbringing. And um, so we've gotten a lot of that. We've gotten others that have shared recordings with us and we encourage it. We say, hey, you know, if you want to share the recording, let us know. Um, That brings me into another thing, if I could do a quick plug. Um, So we, we are also a nonprofit and that was by design because we truly um, want to, you know, do this for the community and we want people to um, come to donate money if they can and get some tax benefits on it. Because like you said, there's a lot of work and we're willing to do it for free. Um, But being a a nonprofit also allows us to look for funding from other sources to make sure that this happens, even if individual donor uh, people aren't able to contribute, right? Um, So in our journey, what we have learned is that we can only record so many stories. Like even if it's like through our storytelling events, through our blog, through our podcast, which you know takes so much time. Um, but there are hundreds of thousands of stories out there and they're not just in the US. I get emails all the time, all over. I, um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but our top five listening countries are uh, US, Canada, UK, Australia, and Vietnam is number five. And the other four countries make sense because they're English speaking countries. And because our show is predominantly in English, we're reaching uh, Vietnamese in the UK and Australia and Canada. And I don't even cover those stories. Like most of my stories are Vietnamese Americans, but there's so many other stories out there. And I get emails all the time from people saying, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I found this. We don't really have something like this in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
we are working on a new initiative. It's not yet available to the public, but um, we do have a prototype that we'll be releasing hopefully at the end of the year and hopefully doing some crowdfunding from the community to help support it, that we're developing um, a digital platform that's called VBP Journeys. So VBP is Vietnamese Boat People Journeys and people will be able to enter their own stories and artifacts and photos and map them. Um, um, and as much detail as you can give us, we can map the, the journey points of your family. But the idea is it's gonna be a digital space where we can collect these stories at much greater scale than we're able to do as you know a finite team behind the scenes. Um, and you know, we hope that when we do launch it, that one, people will sub be willing to submit their own stories. And there it's gonna be um, while there's like a form and some criteria, it's really what however you want to tell your story, whatever point of your story you want to anchor it on, you know, it's your story to tell. So we're not gonna curate it. We're just creating a space so that it can be showcased. Um, and then number two, I hope when people do share their story and see the value of creating something like this for our community that they will contribute. And um, because as you know, designing a technical digital platform is expensive, <laughs> but we think it's it's worth the effort. And um, yeah, there are hundreds of thousands of stories out there and Amazing. we want a space for them to be told. Yeah, well, when that's ready to go, let, let me know and we'll definitely share that. I mean, I, I, the only reason I guess I know as much as I do know, and I started knowing nothing, like I didn't set out to study this, but it's just through these amazing conversations with Swiss Vietnamese, German Vietnamese, British Vietnamese. I have friends who are Australian Vietnamese. Um, and Nima, uh, Mai Le, she must hate me because I tell this story all the time, but it will make you laugh. She told us a story when we first met her. She's a, as Aussie as it comes, right? She sounds proper Aussie, but she can speak Vietnamese. And she was talking to a taxi driver uh, in Vietnamese. And he said, oh, your Vietnamese is so good. And she went, oh, yeah, well, my mom and dad are Vietnamese. And he was like, your Vietnamese is shit. <laughs> Never forgot you know, it's, that. <laughs> it's funny because, like, I think... We just did a blog recently on one of our um, writers wrote about Viet Q, the term Viet Q, and how he feels like when people call him Viet Q, it's not a compliment. Um, when We've he's covered Vietnam, this as well course. because we know it's a yeah. very, uh, yeah, it's, it can be and, controversial. And you should read it. It's our latest episode. I will do, yeah, he absolutely. Does, he does talk about how he hopes one day the term Viet Q is not used to describe people who left their country, but it's used to describe people who love their native country very much and who are trying to hold on to their heritage and culture, who are trying to like pass it on to younger generations, like that the whole term changes meaning for his generation and, you know, and beyond. Yeah. Um, but it's it's very well written and, and very um it's it's a theme and topic that mm. touches us all because we we get it, right? We get like when someone calls you Viet Q, you don't know if it's like <laughs> 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 what they really think of you when you're in Vietnam. Yeah, it's hugely complex. I know from the people we've interviewed, some people easily be like, Yep, no, I'm Viet Q. Other person's like, No, I'm I'm v I'm Swiss Vietnamese. Um, we had Nikki Tranon who uh, the celebrity chef from Netflix, and she's she's Vietnamese but naturalized U.S. citizen, and so she will refuse to be called VQ. She doesn't like that phrase. So uh, yeah, I know it's like it's a it's a minefield, and I I don't know. I don't think there's a wrong or a right answer. It's just one of these things that will have to be discussed and play out. But I'll definitely make sure I read that. So quickly before we move on to the final questions. Very quickly, explain behind you the Vietnamese Boat People logo, because I do know as well that there is a, an amazing story behind your logo. Yeah, so this was early on when I was starting out. Um, and this is like, I think maybe I had, oh yeah, I, I probably launched the first episode or the second with some sort of like free graphic that I found <laughs> somewhere <laughs> that like was royalty free. And um, so we had no logo. And what I decided to do was launch a community competition. 
with a monetary reward. And I had some mentors in the nonprofit space um, that I raised money from. And I said, hey, I want to do this crowdsourcing competition. I want to tell people what our podcast is about. And I want people to submit artwork. Um, And I am going to um, have two winners. One is like, you know, I will pick the winner because this is like the logo that I have to live with for our company. (laughs) But two, I want a people's choice award because maybe some people love something, you know, and see it, the podcast or the concept differently. So I also want a people's choice award. And anyway, so I raised some money and I held a competition. Pretty simple. I said, Hey, this is what our show is about. Design us a logo. Winner gets, um, I think it was like 1500. It was substantial, but I was like, you would pay more than that to get a marketing company, right. To develop your logo. And so, um, Fung is the winner. He is our, um, at the time he was a design uh, graduate student at Yale university. Um, he was born and pretty much grew up in Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh city, um, up until like teenage years. And he came to live with, I, I think, an aunt or an uncle, I can't remember, um, but then spent the rest of his, you know, adolescence in the U.S. And obviously, yeah, it was an amazing school, but he designed this. And I fell in love with it because it's so simple and modern, but it's so impactful. And he also, in addition to the artwork, submitted a whole proposal of the inspiration behind his graphic design. And so... If you see the font type right here, he sent me a bunch of images of storefront and restaurant signs in the 1970s and 60s in Vietnam. So he said he was inspired by that era, um, the font, the typography that was in that area in Vietnam um, of all the buildings that was a combination of French colonial yet Vietnamese independence. And so that's where the typography came from. Um, you'll see the water behind it and those specks of white. Um, the meaning behind that is he said, you know, the journeys that Vietnamese boat people have to go through, the specks of white represents um, families being torn apart, separation. Um, the, it also represents loss, whether it's physical, um, tangible things or just loss of spirit and things that you can't reclaim of, you know, emotions, feelings, confidence. So those torn pieces represent that loss. Um, And of course, the wave is, you know, to represent the boat journey. And then when he did the logo where you see light blue and the dark blue, he said, you know, I always felt like it's like the glass is half empty or half full. And um, depending on the perspective, it's like, you know, the, the people kind of had to live in these hybrid worlds and they were either trying to fill up their glass so that they could have a better life or they were feeling like um, some of them were trying to overcome what they felt like the, the glass was half full um, and still trying to heal from that. So it's very like once you, you read that proposal, you're like, this is it. This is exactly <laughs> what our stories are about. And so it's so simple when you see it, you can't get all of that. But when I explain it to you, it comes to life, Mm -hmm. right? Amazing. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I I don't know if you know what our logo looks like, but most people still don't realize it's a seven and an M and then it makes up a person on a motorbike. So most people just think it's someone riding a motorbike. But if you go look at it, it's actually a clear seven, then an M plus seven million, and then it's a bike. So that's uh, uh, <laughs> that's my little that's my little trick. Um, I just realized that this is only uh, valuable for anyone watching on YouTube because most of our listeners are listening on audio and they've no idea what's behind you right now. <laughs> yeah, but you know, our logo is the, the cover of our podcast, so they'll see. Uh, I was going to say, look at their app. <laughs> if you're listening, if you're listening right now on audio, and you're like, "What the hell are they talking about?" I cannot see this logo. <laughs> Go look at the Vietnamese Boat People podcast. I'll be putting a link for it in the show description. Bring it up. It's an amazing logo. So there, there we go. I just realized that halfway through, I was like, "If you're not watching this right now on YouTube, this is a." Uh, Almost a moot point, but not really. You can definitely go look it up as you listen. So look, thank you so much. This has been 
unbelievably awesome. I've really, really enjoyed this. I've been, uh, I've been looking forward to chatting with you. You can obviously uh, see that uh, I'm a very uh, big fan of the show. You've done an unbelievable job. And then to hear about the work and the effort that has gone into it, then you're like, oh, yeah, I can definitely see that now. So, so well done on that. So we're going to finish up with these questions. I ask everyone these at the end of, this, of each episode. They change every season. Now, we'll see how much of them apply to you because these are designed for people that mostly live in Vietnam. But I think I think we'll be okay. I think we're all right. Okay. So, because we're stuck in a lockdown right now, these are where these questions kind of come from. Well, you've been to Vietnam. You've been on a, a back of a motorbike, I presume, right? Mm-hmm. All right. So I just, used let's to pre- be very scared of being <laughs> back <on a> <laughs> We still are over here. We still are. So, let's just pretend you're in Saigon right now. If you could get on the a motorbike or the back of one, where would you go? Oh, gosh. Um, You know, one thing that I have always wanted to do is actually um, trace all the different cities that my parents have grown up or lived in. Um, So I've been back to most of them, but not all of them. Um, So my parents at one point lived in Guignang. I've never been there. Um, they also lived in Dainan, so I went there. I went to visit the uh, French Academy that my dad used to work at. Um, Nha Jang, I've been there. That's where I was born. But there's so many other places um, that my parents have just had small stopping points in within their lives that I haven't been to. Um, and I think I would start with Green Young. I mean, I think early in their marriage, they have lived there for a couple of years. Some of my siblings were born there. And so I know, and my parents got married young. Like my mom was, um, I think she was 20. So, you know, those are still formative years. And I would like to be able to explore some of the places. I'd like to be able to um, check out like the Catholic school that my mom spent so much of her time in. Like it wasn't like she was there, you know, till 2 p.m. I think she said she was there up until dinner time. And like basically the Catholic school system raised her. Um, so I think those are kind of all the stopping grounds. So I guess maybe not one point in particular. I would I would start with Big Green Young, too. but yeah, I no, think I love so. It. When I, I my grandfather, who I obviously mentioned earlier, was a he was a policeman, not a soldier. He was a policeman in Malaysia um, back in, and I'm going to forget the dates now. I think it was the '60s. No, anyway, '50s, '50s. He was a policeman in Malaysia. Anyway, he worked in a place called Slim River, tiny little place, but always growing up, he always mentioned how he was a policeman in Slim River and would tell you some stories about the time he had to shoot a pig that was stuck by the side of the road and all these kind of stories. So I always knew this place, Slim River. And my wife and I were traveling through Malaysia for a month. And and that was like, ah, oh, we are going to Slim River, like without a doubt. So it was about, uh, I think if I remember a two hour train journey, um, north of KL. So we were in KL and then we specifically got a train there. And it was so funny because this is not a tourist town at all. It's just this tiny, tiny little town, which is basically just got a motorway that runs through it. Like that is all there is, is a motorway. He lived, like he was working or a policeman on like a kampung, like a little village and things like this. So he wouldn't have even been probably where the motorway was. He was probably way out in the jungle somewhere. But anyway, for me, it was just so important to go to this place that he talked about his whole life. And uh, it was one of just the most amazing things ever was to call him and be like, do you know where I am, Grandpa? And Because he knew I was traveling. And I was like, I'm in Slim River right now. And it was like, so that was was really cool to be able to to retrace that steps, even though you get there and it's just like, there's there's nothing here. (laughs) Yeah, you know, but it's still just to say that you've been is is awesome. So obviously in the U.S., uh, I think you guys are pretty free right now, but you've been through various lockdowns or you've been in lockdown or you got in lockdown for like a week or something like that. No, you're in New Jersey. I think you guys had a, a pretty big one last year, right? Yeah, I mean, it's been, you know, similar to a lot of countries. I mean, it's it's a roller coaster, right? I think sure. this summer, um, restrictions started to ease earlier this spring. I mean, um, in the summer, but you know, the Delta variant is still a scare. We're still battling with people not wanting to get vaccinated. And so, you know, in, in some ways, there's a lot of um, just conflicting points of views on vaccination still happening here in the US. And for those reasons, um, 
you know, some businesses have chosen to show proof of vaccination before you enter. Others are still kind of like working through that complexness of like, you know, do I turn somebody down? Do I like cause, you know, a scene, whatever it might be. Um, so that's still all happening. I'm just grateful um, that at least in my town, the school system is back open. Our kids are in school full time. I mean, they're masked, there's social distancing, like we're, you know, the school's trying to make smart decisions, but I think that's extremely important. I mean, any parents with young children can relate that like, you know, even if your children don't know how exp- how to express what they've been feeling, it doesn't mean that they haven't been, um, you know, feeling the strain. And I think oftentimes we think we have it hard as ch- uh, as adults. Like, I think it's hard for children because so much of their development is dependent on socialization, right? That's where they learn things. That's where they learn behavior, values. And when they don't get that, it's hard. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that the school system is open. Uh, restaurants are open, back to normal. But, you know, you never know, right? You never know. I mean, some states um, like Florida and, and others that... Let's not talk about Florida. I can't handle talking about Florida. And I know we're like, let's talk about positive things. We watch US (laughs) news too much. Well, the question was just going to be simply, what what was the most challenging thing for you during the lockdown time? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I think... um, let me let me say this first, where I feel like my perspective might be a little bit different, and um, it might sound a little bit. I don't know how people are going to interpret it, but at the beginning of the lockdown in 2020, it felt very surreal. But I almost like enjoyed it, and here's the reason: is because both my husband and I have such um, demanding jobs at at the time because I was still doing the podcast in corporate America at the time. Um, I felt like the lockdown allowed me to be with my children. We didn't have to commute. Um, We had, you know, we were taking long walks together. We were, you know, they didn't have all these activities that I had to shuffle them to (laughs) on the weekends. And so I actually quite enjoyed it. And then my husband and I were like, having wine and watching TV together. So at the beginning, it was almost like, for me, it was a blessing because there were things that we didn't, because of the hustle and bustle of our lives that we actually never took the time to really um, focus and be present for. Obviously, like other families, that got old quick, right? homeschooling your children, (laughs) you know, never eating out. So like, you know, never like going anywhere. So that got old. And so I think the most difficult thing for me was um, being at home with the kids, but still working. Um, So we were fortunate where we had a babysitter who could, and my son at the time was in kindergarten, like his kindergarten was on Zoom. And you can imagine a five-year-old will not sit in front of Zoom for more than 20 minutes. He learned how to do all sorts of things on his iPad, oh, except for listening I teach to six-year-olds on. I teach six-year-olds on the weekend English. Yeah, and it's hard, right? It's hard to like retain their attention. So for me, the hardest thing at the time was having a demanding job, seeing that my kids were struggling, being at home, isolated, learning on Zoom, and not being able to be there with them because I was working and having somebody else kind of oversee that. And it was really hard for me because I felt that guilt that I think a lot of parents feel um, that, you know, gosh, my children might have all these emotional things that they're not able to express and share. And yet I'm, I'm like, now I, you know, that blissful stage is gone. Now I'm at the point where like, I don't know how to, you know, handle this. I don't know how to address it. And I'm, I'm stuck at my computer for my other job all day. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really hard for me. And that was one of the reasons why earlier this year, I've decided to do Vietnamese boat people full time. Um, the whole experience of 2020 made me realize even more so than ever that life is truly short but extremely valuable and um, how important family is. Like we couldn't see our parents 
Um, so talking about starting the podcast because I wanted to be closer to my parents, we didn't see them for over a year. My children didn't see them. And so for me, those reasons, I said, you know what, I'm going to do the podcast full time because it's what I love. It also allows me to control my hours and time, as you know, where then I was able to um, create spaces where I was there for my children mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I wasn't able to do that when I was like juggling all of these, you know, career choices that I that I had made. So that was really hard. It was a really hard decision. So my next question was going to be what was what has been the best thing about lockdown for you? But I think you already answered that uh, about the beginning of lockdown being quite good, which I think for a lot of people, we were the same. The beginning of lockdown was like really fun and then it <laughs> dragged on a bit. But my, my next question, and obviously you've been to Vietnam, what about Vietnam shocks you the most? Oh my gosh. I, um, well, my first trip back to Vietnam was in 2000 and that like completely shocked me. Um, because I didn't remember the country, but since then I've been several times. Um, I think I mentioned to you, like at one point I had a business with my sister where we made, um, shoes and accessories in Vietnam. And I, Oh, did I not mention that? Okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So when I was in my early 20s, when trade relations had just opened with Vietnam, um, my sister's a fashion designer and I had marketing background. We went there, we started a business, we were inputting goods, we were selling them to Nordstrom's, Mandela Bay in Vegas, like big retailers. Um, and then I went back at one point with the U.S. State Department to do a woman in business tour. And then since then, I've done all sorts of things. I did like a, a volunteer tour there. And um, I would have to say what shocks me the most compared to other Asian countries I've been is the pace in which the country evolves. I mean, it is just unbelievable. And I, I used all those examples of my visit because... Every single time, I feel like the country has changed so much. Um, and so the last time I was there was eight years ago before my uh, first child was born. And we haven't been able to go back since. And with COVID, it just got tricky, obviously. Um, but I remember I went with my husband and it was his first time there. And I was taking him to places that I went in 2005. But when we went back in, um, I think it was 2000. And 10 or 11, I can't remember now, but I was like, wow, it looks so different. <laughs> and um, th that for me is just very impressive. Like, and we were talking earlier just about the, the wealth that is um, there in Vietnam and people overseas has a misconception that it's like this third world country and it's not. Um, and I think the younger generation, so I, it, with the podcast, what I find really interesting is we have a lot of listeners that grew up in Vietnam, but they're now here in the U.S. And they came um, for college or as an adult. So, like, they find our stories fascinating because it's nothing like how they grew up in the Vietnam that they know, right? Um, but what I find so impressive is just how educated they are, how, it, how their Vietnamese, I'm sorry, their English is even better than mine. <laughs> like, um, and then when you go to these other Asian countries, like I've been to um, China maybe like 10 years ago, so I can't compare necessarily. But I remember when I went to China and I thought to myself, like, wow, I would have thought more people speak English in China than in Vietnam. But in Vietnam, almost everybody speaks English. Um, the, the, the sort of um, level of education and sophistication uh, and westernization in Vietnam is actually quite impressive compared to its neighboring countries. You'll be shocked when you come back. If you've not been here in eight years, the level of English here has improved in the six years that I've been here, oh um, which is what I always blame why I don't speak Vietnamese, but it's really my own fault. But anyway, <laughs> last question. Okay. What pleasantly surprises you about Vietnam? Oh, I mean, I would say that too. It's it's shocking, but it's also pleasantly surprising. But that's such a cheap answer. So let me <laughs> jump up with something else. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm not sure. I feel like I feel like what I've known about it was oh, you know what it is. 
the artistry. That was one thing that um, when I first went to Vietnam and why I fell in love with it and wanted to start a business of designing goods was because I did not know growing up how creative, artistic, and talented Vietnamese people were. Um, and I think that pleasantly surprised me because there's also a sophistication to Vietnamese art. I don't know what it is. Like, um, just I think the artistry that is part of the community in Vietnam, it, for me, it just feels like very sophisticated. It doesn't feel folky or not that I don't want to like offend anybody by like making some of these general terms. But I guess where I'm going is that like the level of artistry, the imagination, the um, the technique and the worldly sophistication of it is really impressive. And I don't think that enough people know that Vietnam truly is a creative country as well. Um, and I, I would hope that some of the art that comes out of Vietnam becomes more globally mainstream because I feel like it's still so undiscovered. And in our house, we actually have a couple of um, original paintings that over the years I've either bought in Vietnam or like when my family goes back, I ask them to go to galleries for me because I'm just um, amazed by it. And that is a pleasant surprise because growing up, I don't think, you know, I knew that until I actually went to the country and just looked around me and just saw like how beautiful, you know, people were making all these beautiful things. Mm, yeah, no, great answer. And I think it just ties into what we said earlier is people have this picture in their mind of this wall toned country of paddy rice paddy fields and you know it's never developed or changed but it's a it's a massively different place which is why i love living here and and talking to so many people about it so thank you so so much tracy uh, i've been looking forward to this uh interview since we set it up since even before then i was told you before i was like i want to get her on the show um it's been actually a really surreal experience for me uh, i didn't know what you looked like until we did this and I'd, it's surreal talking to someone and hearing your voice. And I was just listening to your latest episode today and I was like, oh yeah, that's your voice now. That's the person I was listening to today. <laughs> <laughs> so that, but it's been absolutely amazing. I would say give Vietnamese boat people a plug, but I think we've covered that. And I think if you're listening to this podcast this far, you know where to find a podcast. We always say like, oh, go listen to it wherever you find podcasts. If you're listening to this, you know where to go find your podcast. But make sure, please, if you're listening, go check out Vietnamese Boat People. It is unbelievable. Tracy, congratulations on everything you've done. It's, uh, it's an amazing uh, effort by you and all the team as well. So tell all the team um, what an amazing job you guys have done. So thank you so much. Thank you. This was fun. It was a, a great start to the day over here for me. Um, and thanks for staying up late. Oh, it's slow.